Anything else?
Amen. Uh, but I wanted to give you a little testimony of an individual, this guy. He was in the courtyard of the city and he was crying and weeping because he just couldn't get himself under control. And his mama had been praying, praying for him for months, uh, maybe even years by then. Uh, he was in a relationship with a woman, but that was not the woman he was engaged to. It was just a mess. And it was a marriage that his parents had painstakingly set up for him. He could not let go of his licentious lifestyle, his drinking, and all the things that come with it. And as he's sitting in this courtyard, he's praying to God, figuring out why can't I get my life straight out? And in the midst of him just being very upset with himself and weeping, this is what he wrote um, in, in one of his journals. I was weeping in the most bitter contrition in my heart. When I heard the voice of children from a neighboring house chanting, take up and read, take up and read. And I could not remember ever having heard anything like this. So uh, check it out. Looking through my tears, I grabbed Paul's writing, which is Romans, and he read this. Not in rebel drunkenness, not in licentiousness and lewdness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its loss. No further when I read, nor did I need to. For instantly, at the end of the sentence, it seemed as if a light of serenity infused into my heart. And all the darkness of doubt vanished away. He immediately told his mother he was going to go and sit under a man of God. His name was Ambrose. And he became a Christian. He came back to his mother and said, Mother, I have received the Lord and I'm so happy. She said, Son, I don't know what else life can give me now. That is the only thing I wanted in life is for you to know Jesus. And she died not many days later. This man, his name was Augustine. We know him as Saint Augustine. He lived in 400 AD. Did his story sound like any of ours? How many of you have ever heard someone tell you, the Lord will not put on you more than you can stand? Well, they're wrong. <laughs> That's not what that passage means. And, uh, I, and, and listen, I know it's in, we're trying to comfort each other sometimes, but this is what actually Paul meant when he wrote these words out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, so if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has ever overtaken someone that hasn't been common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it. He will never put more on you than you can stand, meaning this. God will never put you in a place where you have to sin. So you can't look at God and he's like, God, why did you let me sin like that? You can't do that, because you know what God can do? Like, do that. I gave you a doorway out. Amen? God has given us many doorways out. Uh, and God opened the door of Augustine's heart, and he became one of the greatest and uh, most known theologians of his time. And we still read his words today. You know what? I believe that a lot of what happened in his life had to do with the prayers. Who? His mom. Every one of us sitting here were a product of someone's prayer. I often wonder how many times the prayers of my mother and father spared me from suffering. I often wonder how many times the prayers that I have lived up right now to my children will guard them in years and years and years to come. Because our prayers outlive us. Because even though we die, he still lives. And if you are in him, you live with him, and your prayers are still valid in a living God. God has called us to be his witness, not just in Macedonia, to the nation, to the world. God has called the church to be the light of the world. And I have to ask you, what has God told you to do here? And are you fulfilling the call of God? 
God has given everyone different roles and different abilities and different talents, but you must answer this for yourself. Am I living under the calling that Christ Jesus has given me? And we see so clearly in the scripture and how God moved and spoke to the apostles during this time and to the disciples. And, uh, you know, I didn't always know I was going to be a preacher. I didn't know that. I knew it was called the ministry. And at a very young age, when I would be getting pray, I would just pray and pray and pray and pray and pray when I was very small, when I was very young. Whenever something ever scared me, I would just pray and pray and pray. And sometimes I'd fall asleep praying. I don't know if any of y'all practice that. And now as I get older now, and sometimes I'll, I'll fall asleep standing up. Amen. And uh, I, I think that'll happen sometimes. But uh, I just remember at a young age, I just love to pray. And then fires and, and testing comes and temptation comes and we wander away. But that scripture is true. Bring up your child in the ways of the Lord, and they will return to that foundation. Amen. I have many things to confirm my call in life. But one thing that will confirm your call is the Word of God. He's given us His Word. His Spirit will confirm your call. The church, those around you, will help confirm your call. But very important is your personal testimony and witness. That will confirm your call. If you're going to talk it, you have to what? Amen. You gotta walk it. And that doesn't mean you will be perfect. And that doesn't mean you won't have mistakes and you'll fall. What's very important is you understand that you have something to hold on to when bad things come. Amen. And so here's where we go wrong sometimes and, and get it wrong. That uh, there's times when we're we have a calling in our life or maybe an idea in our life, and we end up doing ministry. How many of y'all just fell into ministry or do a work for the Lord before and and maybe you're even halfway through it, and you're like, Lord, I'm the wife of you. Amen? And, uh, but there's a few reasons why we end up in places like that. Number one, it's because someone asked you. Someone came up to you and said, hey, we need you. Amen? And you end up serving the Lord that way. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, there's just a need, and it needs to be filled. And sometimes the church just wants a warm body to fill. Amen? And that happens sometimes, too. And uh, then we have uh, Ben. Sometimes it looks real good to be in a high position. And some people see ministry or see callings like that because it just looks real good. And then the fourth reason, and this is the most important, revelation. God revealed to you his will for your life. And this is exactly what happens in this chapter here. And there's only a few ways you can ever get a revelation from God. But one way is certain, spending time with Him. Yeah. You, you can't go wrong with that, spending time with the Lord. But I want to look very closely at the scripture and see how God did it in. And then investigate and see how we do it now. Look at uh, verses 1 through 3 if you can very closely again. So we have them at the Church of Antioch. And there were certain what there? Prophets and teachers. Bar Barnabas, uh, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius, uh, Cyrene, Mene, those who brought up under the, or who had been brought up under the tetriarch and soul. Soul's last there, isn't it? Have you ever listened to the Gospels whenever they mention the apostles or mention the disciples? They always put who first? Peter. And then they end with who? They end with Judas. They go from Peter all the way to Judas in the Gospels. And they're allotted that way because there's some type of position going on. Well, in this moment here, Saul, who will one day be called Paul, one of the greatest New Testament writers and church planners, where is he at? He's at the bottom of the list right here, which is pretty extraordinary. And as they were together, and I love how it says, as they ministered to the Lord. This is that word minister is a uh, uh, liturgia in the Greek, which is where we get the word lit liturgy or liturgy, which means this an order of service. Whether you know it or not, we just had an order, order of service tonight. We started with a song, we had some prayer, 
And then we sung some more, we had some more prayer, and now we're having a teaching and a little bit of we'll have an invitation. That's an order of service. And so as they're ministering to the Lord in a certain way that they probably do very frequently, they're, they're giving him service and, and they're praying to him, worshiping him. And then it says what? They were doing what? Fasting. How many of you like to fast? How many of you have never fasted ever in your Christianity? Amen. That's all right. Let's be bold. If you never fast, that's all right. Amen. Uh, how many of you tried it and you said, nah, that's not for me? <laughs> Amen. Right? Oh, well, these guys were ritually doing this a good bit. They were giving service unto the Lord in a, in, a, in, a, in a very structured way, and they were fasting, and the Holy Spirit was present. Amen. And the Holy Spirit spoke to them. It spoke to them. And it said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the word to which I have called them. And then having, and they did some more what? Fasting, and they prayed, and they laid hands on them, and then they sent them away. I love this. You know what they didn't do? They did it all wrong. They, uh, they uh, didn't have a vote. They didn't vote on this, right? Uh, they uh, didn't call a committee together and make sure to confirm these guys, did they? Well, they were bad as a parent. I don't think they were. I bet they ate them, didn't they? After they fasted, they did. Uh, now, this might be a little foreign to us a little bit, but they strictly depended on prayer, fasting, and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit spoke for itself. I think that's pretty extraordinary. And it's hard to find uh, a church these days that do it this way and uh, not get so complicated sometimes. Now, um, some of us aren't a fan of fasting. So uh, I, I do want to read you a passage of scripture. Jesus says, uh, not if you fast, he says, when you fast. And he says, and when you fast, don't look visible or like hypocrites who make themselves look miserable as they're fasting. So everyone will know, hey, I'm holy, I'm righteous, and I'm fasting. Amen. Because God who sees in secret, amen. Amen. He wants to bless you and enrich your life secretly. Because at the end of the day, what we do for God should be solely for God. Amen. It's for Him. Not for appearances, not to look good, not to look righteous, but the, the end result of fasting is always seeking His revelation. You want to get closer to God, you want Him to reveal something to you. And so it's not just about not eating. It's about depriving the flesh of the things it feeds on and solely giving your spirit the food that it needs. Our spirits hunger and thirst for something that this world cannot give us. That's why Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and prepared himself to enter into public ministry. He went and fought and faced the enemy, the enemy. And he was tested and tried and remained sinless for us. He was tempted in every way possible, but he depended upon his Father in heaven. And fasting, we learn things on him and not what we can get for ourselves. Amen? Man, we're really good at getting for ourselves. Amen. Isaiah said through the Lord, if you would return to a real fast, I would bless you. When you're not trying to get what you want, but when you're trying to do what I want. Amen. And that's so incredibly hard because we know what we want. But it's trying to discover what he wants. And in this moment, as they pray to the past of the Holy Spirit revealing them, what God wanted. And he sent them all. And look at uh, verse uh, 4 and 5. This is very important. So being sent by our out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also brought food with them. John as an assistant. Well, this is really interesting, guys, because the Holy Spirit, when it spoke to them, who did it say to set apart and say? Just Barnabas and Paul. 
That's all. That's all it asks to say. That's just so interesting. Uh, how many of you ever heard something from God and you say, "Well, that's a good idea, God," but I'm just going to do it a little like this. Have you all? Any of you ever done that? You just kind of add what God told you to do. Well, I feel like uh, they kind of did that with this, and we'll kind of see how that plays out in a second. But uh, read verses six and eight with me. Now, when they got through the island of Patmos, they found who? A certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. That means son of Bar means. Who was of the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intellectual man? This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear what? The word of God. And guess who tried to stop him? This sorcerer. Uh, Christians, when you receive a call from God and you take up the mantle of that call, you will face conflict. It will come. That conflict might come from within. That conflict might come from without. But please hear my voice. You will experience conflict, and it's not God's fault. Don't blame God when you experience conflict. God is there to strengthen you through that conflict. Uh, some of us, as soon as we face some conflict, we immediately want to retreat. But doesn't it say that we would not have a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-control? Amen. And besides this, God has given us some great weapons, hasn't he? Uh, he's given us the sword. And uh, he's also given us armor. I think many of us know this scripture very well. It says this in Ephesians 6. Uh, it says this in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand a while as food. The devil. One of the most convincing lies he's ever told is that he doesn't exist. He's very rich. And he has a lot of friends. And it says in verse 12, For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, Stand for and fasten the belt of truth around your waist. Put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet. Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. And with all these, take a shield of faith, which you will be able to quench what? The fiery darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit and of the word of God. And here is very important. We stop reading here. But look at verse 18. It says this. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert, and always persevere in supplications for all of the saints. Pray in his Spirit constantly. That will hold some things together. There was a, a young man who joined the Gideons, and he was in a country that you should not be in if you have Bibles, especially Bibles in that country's native language. And he had a case full of these Bibles in his trunk, taking them across this country to get to a location to hand out Bibles to people who don't have the Word of God to read. And as he's driving, he's getting through this little rural area, sort of like Macedonia, but over there, and his car breaks down. And he immediately becomes petrified and praying to God because he realized if one of the authorities just happened to stop by, they're going to look through his stuff. I mean, they're just going to, they're going to seize America, they're going to look through his things. And he's so petrified, and sure enough, this big old truck comes driving up behind him. And these two big guys get out and come around to the pastor's side door and knock on it. And he said, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. And he cracked it down a little bit, and he's like, yes, sir. You have the book? He says, sir, what book? Now listen, he knows he has books, not just a book, but books. The book, the greatest book on the earth. And the guy's like, you have the book. 
What do you mean, sir? You have the book of Jesus. He said, uh, yes, sir, I do. And in his heart, he knew that this is it. And the guy said, I had a dream. A man told me to come to this road because there'd be a man here to give me a book about Jesus. And he not just gave that guy one book, he gave him several books to take to their families. And then they left. He's still forgotten. He got in his car, he tried to crank it, and he cranked <laughs> it. I mean, uh, wow, isn't that uh, quite amazing? God's pretty amazing. There'll be times when we're afraid. It's okay to be afraid. There's some of the most greatest people in the Bible, they were afraid. But here's the thing they turned to God and depended on Him, even when they were afraid. Amen. The Apostle Paul, this is the first time he's had this level of conflict of a supernatural type. This guy is some type of sorcerer. And Paul didn't back down, did he? I mean, did you read earlier what he said to this guy? I mean, look at what Paul says in verse 10. Uh, it says that, um, and I love how it says in verse 9, then Saul, who was called Judah, Paul, this is so important. This is a change happens here. Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not able to see the sun for a time. Amen. And it says, This, is, this guy went blind. He was stumbling around. I mean, could you imagine that? And listen, the things he said, we probably shouldn't say to someone else, right? I don't suggest you go to Walmart and someone offends you and say, you son of a devil. <laughs> I just don't think that we should do that. But Paul was talking to a child of wrath. This individual was trying to prevent a man from hearing the word of God. And that in itself is the act and the works of the devil. Amen? And if anyone knows what it is to be blind, it's Paul. Because he was on a road to Damascus. And he was going to go and he was going to round up some Christians and kill them in the name of his God. But behold, a bright light shone and he was knocked on the ground. And he said, Lord, who are you? And he said, I am his eye, Jesus. Whom you persecute. And the first thing Paul said is, What am I to do? Amen. You know, sometimes we have to admit we're blind before we can see. Amen. And if you think you see, and you think you know what's going on, you might be missing something. I like this old country fella. He lived in North Carolina on the side of this big old mountain all his life. And sure enough, the, the city finally found this country, and they built a little town, and they built a little road around the mountain so people can look at the skyline up there. And one of his relatives came, and they said, Uncle, let me drive you up on that mountain. He goes, son, I've been living here for years. I don't need to go on that mountain. I've been, I, I've been there long enough. I've seen it all. And he said, no, Uncle, please let me just drive you up on top of the mountain. He said, all right. And so they took that long drive up the mountain and they got up to that big area where he could go out and look at everything. And that old fella got on the side of that railing and he looked at the world. And he looked at his nephew and said, son, I've lived here my whole life and I almost missed it. I didn't know I could see this. And I've been here the whole time. And Christians, there are some of us, we've been real close to God, but we've never really seen it. Yes. We've been real close to religion, but we've never really lived and been in church. And if you're not careful, you might get so close and you miss it. Yes. What we need to do is pray the past and seek Him. And God will open up our minds and our hearts to the things we've seen before. 
You see, after this moment, after Paul kind of takes over, look at verse 13. Now, Paul and his party set sail. You see, Christians, when it started out, it was Barnabas and Saul. Now, in this moment, it's Paul and his party. The Holy Spirit set aside Paul to be a leader. And then it says, John Mark left. And later, when John Mark wanted to come back and travel with him, Paul said no, and Barnabas said yes. And their contention grew so much that Paul and Barnabas split ways, and they've been buddies for years and years. Paul just didn't want nothing to do with John Mark because he thought he was a quiz. You know what it says later in Scripture? One of Paul's last letters he ever wrote, the second Timothy. He said, please send Mark. For he is useful to me this time. And let's not forget that it was Mark who did the gospel of Mark that we have today. Guys, sometimes we're going to fail. We're going to fail. We're going to fail that. But that does not exclude you from the power of what Christ can do in it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Please stand and go to Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, let none of us get so close to you but not see you. Let none of us serve you without ever having your spirit inside of us. Lord Jesus, let none of us participate and be a part of the church but without being the church that you call us to be. God, I pray that you would awaken our hearts and minds to how you have called us to live and to work. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.